So um, I'm Lays with Park, and I'm here with Clyde Associates um, to talk about my experience of using the deep programming language um, in the investment world. Um, who here has knows much about D? Has sort of you know written programs or downloaded the compiler? Anyone? Um, who here has written programs in D or downloaded the compiler? No one. Okay. All right. That's good. Um, so. You know, I'm speaking for myself, not for any of my clients. Um, I'm, well, Clyde is, is a boutique um, startup firm that consults on economic and investment strategy um, and also applying technology to the investment process. Um, what I'm interested in is less in automating things and replacing human beings, but more in using technology to um, augment, to amplify human capability. Um, and that's sort of how I, I came to use Um The modern world is very complicated, so particularly in finance, and I'm going to tell you a story to begin. Um, a long time ago, in a universe far, far away, there was a young man who joined a warlord who lived in a castle, and the warlord had some clever machinery for laying siege to the enemy, and this machinery was based upon the idea that, there's only, that, 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 that there are many ways to do it, and more than one way to do it. And it was good. For the enemy is always changing, and the snares and tricks of war must change with him. And the young man was given command of some troops and won his battles, and the success of his forces grew. The warlord was an excellent military leader, and his ambitions grew with his success. In order to achieve his ambitions, he consulted an oracle. And the oracle said that this machinery is not scalable, not maintainable, and there is only one way to do it, and you must replace Perl by C++. And this is not so good. For whilst the machinery was being dismantled and rebuilt, the enemy continued to change his tactics and stratagems, and the young man could no longer adapt. The machinery was built and built and built, and by the time it was complete, neither the young man nor any of his colleagues remained with the warlord. And there was no longer anyone there who remembered how to use it. So to return to the world of today, technology is critical to the investment process. You need productivity and correctness, but you also need efficiency and plasticity, because markets are always changing. And what worked fine five years ago simply won't work today. On the other hand, technology itself is always changing. Um, People, there's a tendency today to say that you know, Moore's law will always bail you out. Um, you know, that's been the case since 2000. We've had a window when that's been true. Um, is it true today? Maybe. Um, but data sets are growing, and um, memory isn't getting quite, you know, it's, it's not getting as fast as quickly. So, and you know, one, one tends to write software that lasts for much longer than you ever planned for it to. So you can't afford not to spend some time considering it. I spoke to a colleague at a $20 billion hedge fund who does algorithmic trading. And um, I asked him how big his data sets are today compared to 10 years back. And he said more or less 10 times. And obviously, memory is only twice as fast. Um, so you know, he said that as far as prototyping goes, you can drag NumPy from his cold dead hands. But when it came to processing logs, um, Python just choked, you know, when it got to tens of gigs. Um, whereas, you know, with, um, with D, which is um, what he used, um, things were fine and he was reasonably productive in that. So in 2014, um, I started to build some tools. Um, applying technology to the investment process, um, you know, in either distinct process, it's not, it's, it's really a discretionary process, and um, I wanted to solve my own problems, and I figured that, you know, by solving these, there are likely others who, who will benefit, and, and that's been the case. Um, I started out with Python and then Sice, and, and for various reasons, it wasn't the thing for me. I mean, it was okay to start with. Um, it's not a Python talk, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, but I'm sure there must be a, a better solution, and I kind of searched around, and, and that's how I found D. Um, so what is D? Um, it's a multi-paradigm programming language with roots in C and C++. 
Um, it's borrowed ideas from many different sources and, in return, has been a source of ideas for other languages. Um, originally, the concept was, you know, C++ done right, um, and it's no longer that. It's just its own thing. Um, the, um, the guys behind it, um, two, two men, uh, one, Walter Bright, he was the first, he was the first chap to write um, a C++ compiler, um, you know, a native C++ compiler for the PC, and he also is the only chap, only person to have ever written an entire C++ compiler by himself. Um, and, you know, the advantages of that history, because developing things in those days, resources were very constrained, and so he was a small company competing with many large companies. So his age was to make it very fast. The compiler was very fast. Um, and that's still the case today. Um, the other person involved is Andrei Alexandrescu. Um, some of you may know him. He's um, known, or some would say notorious, for his work on template metaprogramming, um, the inventor of the term modern C++. He's written many, several books um, on that idea. He was, until very recently, um, a research scientist at Facebook, um, and he sort of deployed D there um, for some wins. So, for example, the, their C and C++ preprocessor is written in D, and it's significantly faster than what they had before. Um, and one reason for that was that they were... Because D is so plastic, it allows you to iterate rapidly. So, of course, yes, in theory, you could write it just as quickly in many different languages, but be because it was... because because it compiles quickly and you're able to iterate quickly and there's a built-in profiler, um, they're able to make it very fast at you know, reasonably modest cost and he's open source that. So um, there's a kind of creative tension between the two men. You know, Andre's quite high-level thinker you know, with an back, academic background in computer science. Walter's more of, a, um, you know, more of an engineering type. He's got a strong aesthetic sense. You know, code should look right on the page. And... The consequences of this combination are that, you know, it's, well, it's a very well-designed language, um, the language and standard library. But at the same time, all those little things that make programming, you know, either hell or, or, or pleasure to use are, you know, they're all, all little things are all done right. Um, and it's sort of a notorious complaint on the, on the forums amongst people who program C++ in their day jobs that it's very difficult for them to continue to do that because they know how much more sort of elegantly and beautifully it can be done in D. Um, I mean, I, th I think it's interesting to, I mean, Nuth gave this talk and it's become a soundbite that, you know, productivity, people focus far too much on, on opt premature optimization and, you know, you should focus on the 3% th that really matters. Um, in the same talk, he also talked about the benefits of having a proliferation of languages, of, of different ways of thinking and about algorithms. Um, you know, a programming language is really an expression of thought. And um, so there's benefit to having a language that matches the way you think and that's suited to the problem domain. Um, you know, and it, there's a kind of, you know, there's an aesthetic aspect as well. If you, um, if you, if language is a pleasure to use and it fits with what you're trying to do, um, one's just much more productive and efficient and it's easier to read your code and others' code in the language. Um, so what is D? Um, you know, what's it like, really? Um, it's opinionated in some respects. So, you know, loop shadowing is not allowed. You can't reuse a, a local variable inside a, a block. And, you know, I just was really irritated by that in the beginning. How dare you tell me what to do? But, but actually, looking <laughs> at it and seeing, seeing the compiler error messages, I found that very often it caught many errors that I just w would have made without realising it and it would have been painful to, to find before. Um, so it's, all, it's quite thought through. Um, so it's opinionated, but not too opinionated. Um, you can sort of pick the style of code according to the problem, you know, that you face. So... If you want to write um, D like C to use on an embedded device, well, D, D like a better C to use on an embedded device, you can do that. Um, you can also program at quite a high level. Um, and, you know, it's got sort of functional concepts, immutability, full parallelism, there's message passing. Um, 
the, web, the fact that it compiles fast is quite, you know, is, is I found to be a reasonable advantage because, um, you know, you can start off with a simple little prototype um, and, you know, see what results are. You can, you can iterate quickly and um, sort of you, the code kind of morphs in a quite a dynamic way, which makes it much easier to adapt to the problem when you're not quite sure what the solution should look like. But also, um, you know, you're in my area, the business changes very quickly. So even though in some sense I'm both the client and the guy who's providing the solution, um, I don't exactly know what I want to be doing, you know, next month because I'm not in control of the market. And, you know, what, what, what I need to be doing will, will, will shift as market conditions shift. Um, I guess I'll start by, by um, you know, exploring some good reasons not to use D. You know, it's not for everyone. Um, and it's certainly not as mature a language as, you know, C++ is, um, you know, which has benefits and costs too. Um, it's probably not great for building very complex GUI interfaces. Um, there are GUI libraries. You can do quite a lot. But if you need to use any of the kind of large C++ frameworks, um, you're going to have to either, you know, well, you're, if you do that, you're going to have to accept your, it'll be a bit, bit of work to, you know, there are bindings, but they're not perfectly maintained. Um, I think also if you've got, you know, a team of relatively experienced junior programmers um, and, you know, they need to be productive quite quickly, in other words, like the situation that Go was developed for, then um, the documentation is, you know, is, is okay, it's getting better, but it's not... Um, it's not like Python where, you know, you can Google for a solution and it'll be broken down for you and beautifully presented. Um, so that's certainly an area that, you know, could be a problem. Um, it's actually a pretty good language for scripting, which is funny for, you know, C family language. Um, but the set of libraries is more limited. So if you want to, um, if you're doing a whole bunch of different things and today using one library, tomorrow another, then um, there's probably a, you know, you might want to think about, about, about whether it's the best thing for that. Um, I think also if you, you're operating with a large code base that isn't C family, I mean, you know, people use it for Java, um, to, to talk to Java, um, but you then you need to do some work to create the interface. Um, bad reasons? I mean, um, I'm mean, indebted to the, the, the thoughtful commentators on Reddit for providing providing me with this list. Um, I think that, I mean, there, there's these sort of standard talking points. Everyone, Andre said that, says that, you know, it's a pain to learn a new language. So the first thing that you hear when someone talks about something new is a reason not to spend the time. And, and I think that's quite right. So, um, you know, there's some standard talking points that maybe never applied or once did apply and don't so much today. Um, one is, you know, cons there used to be two standard libraries, Tango versus Fabos, that sort of ancient history now. Um, there, are, there are three different compilers. So there's um, the reference compiler called DMD, and that's, you know, that's developed by Walter Bright. It's very fast. Um, you know, people say Go is fast, but this, you know, DMD is really fast. It, to the extent that you can use it, I mean, you can, you can use it as in, a, in a script, so you can put a ha hash bang um, and you know, run it dynamically. Um, you can use it in a Python notebook, um, which is quite nice. So you can sort of interoperate with Python. Um, then there's um, an LLVM backend and a GCC backend. So they're slightly slower than DMD. They're still you know, reasonably fast. Um, but you know, the, the code, DMD's code speed is, you know, Walter's focusing on language, not keeping his compiler cutting edge. So DMD is a bit slower than, than, um, than the LLVM or GCC compilers. Um, but it, you know, it's fine for many things. But if performance really matters, you know, you're probably not going to want to use DMD. Um, you know, but in, pra you know, in practice, the, um, they share the same front end. So um, there's not you know, fragmentation of having different compilers. It's an advantage, particularly also for running on, on different devices because, you know, GCC and um, LLVM run on many different things. Um, the, the compiler is, um, reference compiler is, is not strictly open source, but, you know, it's up on GitHub, and the only reason it's not is just Walter wrote 
the back end when he was working with someone else and he's just not able to completely open source it, but in practice, you know, if you want to redistribute it, just ask him and he'll say, please don't see me and it's fine. Um, it is a garbage collected language and very often people carry preconceptions with them, you know, from the early days of Java or whatever. So people sometimes have this religious, <laughs> almost religious um, sort of opposition to GC. I mean, um, it's not an amazing garbage collector. It's, it's a lot better than it was, but you don't need to use it if you don't want to. It's quite, it's really, it's pretty easy to avoid using. So you can use, um, there's a, an allocator that Andre has written and he talked about it at the C++ con recently, um, you know, porting it to C++ really. Um, so the containers that go on top of that and it's pretty easy, you know, to use free lists or, you know, um, uh, local heaps, you know, freeps. Um, it's it's a, bit, a little bit more work, but it's you know really fairly easy. Um, other concerns: it's you know been around since two thousand and one and not gone anywhere. I mean, there's this weird thing where people think that what people say about languages is the same thing as what's going on. Um, for whatever reason, it's not drawn as much press as some other languages, um, but you know, what actually counts is are people using it. Um, here are some statistics on daily compiler downloads um, since 2013. So you can see that, you know, it's volatile and it tends to go down over the summer, but it's increased from 200 downloads a day to, you know, 1,300. Um, and, um, you know, the other aspect that particularly large users are concerned about is you know, every language seems to need a corporate sponsor to take off. So, you know, Go is Google, Java, you know, Sun, and um, C, even C had, you know, Bell Labs, TNT, but, um, and, and that would have been a reasonable concern to many people. Um, uh, it's changed though, um, it, it changed yesterday. So there's a company called Sociomantic that um, started by two Eastern PhDs. Um, they bootstrapped it from scratch. They, what they do is basically advertising bidding. So, um, you know, you, when you go to your browser and you see an advert, um, that space is auctioned off in real, in real time, it's sort of soft real time. Um, and they've written that completely in D. And, um, you know, they're sponsoring the next D conference. And Andre left his job at Facebook to work on D full time. So he set up a D foundation. And um, this is sort of the first thing to come out of it. So they you know, they got bought for $200 million by um, Dunhunby, which is a division of um, Tesco. I didn't know they were so, so um, technology oriented, but evidently they are. Um, they, yeah, they got bought for $200 million and they're going to be much more you know, active in, in D and I think they're sponsoring it. Um, I'll just touch on generic reasons to use D before I go on to, you know, what I've what I found to be helpful. Um, you know, the semantics are very similar to C and C++. So, you know, there's one company that uses um, D and they said, we give C++ programmers code to read. And like, it's a test to see whether they can make sense of it sometimes. And we give people D code. And even if they've never seen D, they can read it. So, um, you know, the basic mathematical operations object layouts, calling conventions are, are very, very similar. Um, and you can take code that's written in C or C++ and translate it pretty straightforwardly without you know, making many changes. I think Python, Python that's not sort of heavily metaprogramming is also quite easy to port. Um, you know, on the library front, it's quite important that you can, you know, it connects directly to, to um, C. So, if you want to declare a D function with, um, with the C calling convention, you just write X turn C before it. Um, so, you, so, you know, D can call C, C can call D, it's all very straightforward. Um, and you can use, you know, if you want to, you can use pointers and, and so on. Um, the C++ integration is getting better. Um, it sort of, it works now, but constructors and destructors are not there. So, so people are, Within a year, I guess, you can, you'll probably be able to use you know, standard string and so on. Um, the, um, you know, the language is very plastic, and one of the reasons for that is that 
it's um, got some very nice compile time capabilities. So you've got, you've got template and stream mixins, um, compile time function execution. I mean, C++ is, is having some of these things now, but you can do more in D and it's sort of a, a lot easier. So um, even if the language doesn't quite do what you want, you can, you know, which usually does, you can still achieve your goal by using, making use of these functions. Um, and you know, the, the reason that it's useful for me is that I can, I can have a model of what I want to achieve. You know, as, as, a, as an investment guy who does technology rather than a pure technology guy, um, because like, it's important for me to be able to solve my problems. You know, technology is a superpower for solving for your own problems. Um, and um, so it kind of allows you to you know, map your model of things to code without you know, being forced into a box that just doesn't fit, fit your problem and what you're trying to do. Um, you know, and it's fast. It's, um, it's naively, and, Andre says, said at Facebook um, about C++ that naively written C++ will be fast. You know, it, it'll be fast, reasonably fast. You know, and that's generally the case with D as well. So apparently the fastest JSON parser in the world, according to some benchmark, is, is D, and it's like 0.35 seconds to pass a million lines of XYZ JSON coordinates. You know, and um, I, I guess C is two seconds or something. Of course, you know, C can be made as fast as D, but the point is that um, because it's very easy to iterate and because you can combine, you can combine sort of quite high level concept with inline ASM, it's easy to make it fast. Um, so I have a maybe slightly unconventional background for, um, you know, compared to many people who were talking here. Um, I started programming in 1983, and I used programming in my work, um, you know, in finance. And so I'm basically a, a portfolio manager. Um, so I, I try and take, you know, I try and take, I form a view about opportunities and markets, and technology is obviously a very powerful tool to, to help you do that. Um, I, you know, programmed until about 2003, and then I got, just got too senior to, to, um, to be able to justify the time. Um, things changed a bit. I think that, you know, I set up a hedge fund, and um, we had 1,600 people applying for, you know, two jobs, and, you know, I hired a guy who had done um, physics postdoc, had been working for several years, you know, writing code for a living, pretty much. And I found that it was very difficult to, to communicate what I wanted to do without understanding, you know, current technological possibilities. So, you know, you, you need to combine an understanding of, of technology and the problem domain in one mind if you want to get an effective, um, you know, an eff effective high quality solution that, that, that solves the problem well. I mean, you'll get there in the end otherwise. Um, so I started programming again in 2014, having kind of thought about it, you know, um, I found, I mean, I, I, I learned Python to start with, and um, I found D actually, I mean, I, I knew C already, which maybe means it's not a fair comparison, but I found D pretty, pretty easy to learn. Um, it's one of the nice things is that you don't need to learn the whole language to start with. I mean, I think often with, when, you, when you're learning a new language, the problem is that you're used to feeling extremely competent, and you start off with something new, and it's, you know, there's this big energy gap until you can actually be productive. So, um, because you can just start out writing a, a straight C, um, you know that that's you don't quite have that problem to the same extent. So you can start off, you know, using pointers, or whatever, using malloc, and step by step, as you kind of, you know, you read a bit about it, you can try something and you can learn the advanced features. Well, you know, pretty relatively straightforwardly. Um, you know, it's obviously easy to port your existing code if you want to. Um, you can embed Python in D, um, and you know you don't need to worry about about sort of reference counting and so on. That's all taken care of for you by um, by this kind of compile time, um, you know, metaprogramming. So you can, so I, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff in D, but for something like a web scraper, 
there's no point in my trying to port that or rewrite it. So I, you know, I embed, I use a, um, I, I use like Phantom JS. I embed that as a string in my decode. So the bit, you know, that that controls the browser is is in Python, but then the high level logic is in, is in D. So it, it slots in very nicely with the rest of my code base, which is is mostly D. Um, so. The D community. Um, I think some languages are, you know, they kind of have very good marketing and it's very well presented, and they kind of suck you in, and, you know, with with an attractive proposition. And when you get down to it, it it's a little bit more complicated. It's not quite as, I mean, it's it's true, but it, it, it it's more complex than that. D is, I think, historically the people involved have been, you know, they've been hardcore programmers, hacker types, and so they're more interested in writing code than in they're more interested in writing code than in kind of making it shiny. It's, it's very much not a glossy, shiny language today. So um, the impression you get is, is quite workmanlike. It's not, um, you know, I think it's, it's a sort of hidden gem. It, it's better than you think in first look if you're, you know, human beings are, are always influenced by the way something's presented. Um, it's a community where people have sort of high standards and so they, they grumble a lot because they're not. Things aren't perfect, and they're not where they'd like them to be. You know, the good thing is that they have high standards, but it's easy when that to get, you know, distorted view. Um, documentation. It's you know, when I when I started using D, it was fantastic, completely correct and clear. Provided you had a background in computer science, you know, which um, for the rest of us, it was um, a particular people I worked with. And so on, and that's that's much better now. It's still um, an area of development, um, and there's some distance to travel. And I think this the foundation will, will make a difference. Um, you know, with Python, you can just Google it, and you'll see you know 20 Stack Overflow answers and loads. Um, D, you might may find it, but you may not. And so, for some reason, people don't they don't seem to like to ask very often, um, even you know. When they, so uh, you know, one will get much further if you ask for help. But when you do ask for help, um, people, I mean, it's amazing. Um, it's not going to be the case every time. But very often someone will say, look, I've got to fix my code, and my doing wrong, and, and someone will re rewrite their code for them. I mean, even quite sort of large pieces. Um, the guy who was doing scientific computing and trying to, um, he found that D was fast, but then Python multiprocessing was much faster. And it was to do with memory allocation sort of in an inner loop, um, which you know, the, up, the upside of garbage collection is it's easy. The downside is in the beginning, it's, you're not aware, you're not clear about what it's doing. So, um, so you know, I got, I got, rewrote his code for him, and it was you know, much faster. Um, and um, you know, that's been a repeated experience, something I see myself. And had. Um, the, because it's a small community, you do have, I mean, it's small work. It's growing, but um, you do have the benefit of um, being able to interact with some of the, you know, Boilercats programmers in the world. So um, a guy that, I, that I've hired to work with me um, said that, you know, it's like taking a free course from, you know, Andrea Alexander, and you can't, you couldn't buy that. Um, and I, you know, I think generally the communities. The language and the community are in a transition phase. So two years ago, it was, you know, well, I'm a Java programmer, and um, this is how I use D for my personal projects. And that's changed quite a lot, notably. So now it's sort of like, well, we're a company, this is what we're doing, we're using D to do these things. Um, so that's, um, I figured I should show some code, even though um, it's, it's sort of hard to capture a, you know, relatively diffuse and large project. Um, that's one of the things I'm doing is I've got some market data. And um, you know, market data can be different forms, and um, like even for the same instrument. So at the very least, for market data, you have a date and a close. But you, know, you might have an open high-low close. You might have a high-low close. Maybe you have volume and interest. Maybe you won't. 
um, and then you know maybe there'll be intraday data or um, daily data, but I'm also interested in historical data. So you know obviously a date from 1727 generally is an error, but it might not be for some kinds of um, you know for some if, if you're interested in very long term time series. Um, you know, history doesn't begin with the first point in the Bloomberg chart. So if you're in a very long time, term time series, you might want a different kind of date that, that has a different way of validating it. So, um, so this is a, my kind of price bar. A, a, a price bar meaning just like one price representing one time period. So um, this, you know, and I, I can have different choices of, um, well, I can represent it using a float a double or an int or long, whatever it is I want, that's the value type there. Um, so the sort of static if um, is a compiled time, um, it's compiled time code. So um, it's, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a type that's very flexible. It's basically can be templated based upon the price bar type. Um, I can use floating point or fixed point, which is what the decimal places is there. Um, and so, I can create an instance of this that's adapted to the particular series I have. Um, then if I actually, so, so, so this type is defined at compile time, um, but I can then write a generic routine that will take, will take this price bar and operate on it, you know, tr by treating it in a generic way. So, um, I don't know if you are familiar with sort of technical analysis, but there's a Japanese chart in Sydney called Ichimoku. It's not very complicated, um, but this is, you know, many languages it would be a lot more code okay than this. Um, so this takes the, the the syntax for D is a bit different. So some price bar is um, is the is a template parameter, um, and you know I, I pass it. Um, some bars and some parameters, um, and it doesn't need to know, you know, whether it's got um, volume or open interest. This particular function, you know, another because it's not used in the calculation. So I, I can pass, I can, I can, I can pass the data around and sort of um, and treat it generically. Um, so I mean, that's the. That's the kind of overall picture of, um, of D, but I'm very happy to, to go into a bit more detail depending upon what's most interesting. Um, I'm just curious, you, you said that you can, you can program, you know, you can program in it like you might program in C if you want. Yes, definitely. But then there are also functional consequences. Yes. So if I, if I speak sincerely and honestly, in the beginning I wrote it like C, um, because that's, that's the language I was familiar with and it's um, well, it, you know, been used for many years. And over time, you know, I sort of like loops and so on because, because it just felt familiar. But over time, I became you know, more comfortable with doing things, um, you know, maybe not in a super high level way, but you know, using immutable data for um, you know, and, message, and message passing rather than, you know, Sharing data and yes, completely. I mean, it's you know you've got lambdas and you've you know they're first class objects, so you can um, and um, you know it's got Andre's written this library called you know STD algorithm, and it's really pretty good. And it's it's you don't you can you don't need to be that clever to use it. <laughs> so you can you know. You, you, it's got actually did algorithm and it, there's also some functional stuff um, in in a separate library. So, um, you know, for what I'm doing, I you know I, I kind of use map filter reduce quite a lot, and it, it makes it much easier to see what's going on. I think over time, probably I'll move in that direction. Particularly as I've got people who are more familiar with some of those paradigms to um, you know to work in the code base. Any other questions? What yeah. Is what, what is so um, there are a few different bits. One is um, there are some sort of so I've got a market data server, 
and um, that's you know I saw I saw the data in HD5 and used um, a library written by the guy who one of the founders of Zero MQ Nano Message um, to kind of you know to talk to clients um, so it's very easy and straightforward um, and it you know it's really not much code um, and then I have various systematic building blocks for price data um, and at one level. You know, the highest frequency that I really care about mostly is one minute buzz. So performance isn't that big a deal. But sometimes you're going to have this stuff inside, you know, a couple of layers of loops and there'll be some kind of fitting thing and you really care about it then. So I'm trying to kind of write stuff with some forethought. Um, then you know, there's a kind of charting thing that's sort of a necessary evil because I'm more interested in, you know, you need to be able to chart stuff to see it, to be sure it's correct. Um, you know, I, the idea is to, to look at... What I really want to do is look at time horizons for one minute through one month, but displace them very simply. So I'm just looking at a daily chart because the problem is information, you, you get overwhelmed with stuff and you can't... You know, if you try and do it by hand, it gets very tiring. Um, then there's some, let's say, sentiment analysis type work that's sort of at a relatively early stage. Um, and, you know, again, it's nice that, you know, text is, there's quite a lot of it. And people say you're constrained by about 2.1 gigabits a second with a consumer grade SSD, you know, cost you less than 300 pounds, so for, for half a terabyte. So, so it's, um, that's an area that I'm working on currently, and I think you know will be quite interesting. Um, and there's sort of some other things on, on top of that. Um, any other questions about about the language, um, or you look puzzled? I was wondering if I had other questions. Uh, So the, the, like the first, the easy thing to do, the easiest thing to do is to use a garbage collector. So, um, you know, um, there are a lot of people who have a very strong aversion. You know, they just hear the word, they run, run a mile. And I think there's this sort of, there are these connotations of the early days of Java. Um, and I can understand that. You know, I felt the same way once. Um, but what it helps with is correctness. So you know, you know you're not going to be needing to worry about leaking. Um, and, you know, your code is quite clear. Um, obviously, the problem is real, really latency, not, um, not necessarily speed. I mean, you know, it uses more memory, and memory is expensive compared to many other resources. Um, so the DGC is, is not the strongest point, but it's gotten a lot, a lot better. So, you know, most, most objects are not that big, and you know, most... You know, there are some areas you really need to be concerned about, but you know, it's not going to be that much of it. Um, that being said, if you, you know, if you want, first of all, you can use malloc, so you don't need to, um, or you know, you don't need to use GC. Um, but it's probably better to use. Um, there's a library by Andrei Alexandrescu um, called STD Experimental Allocator. Um, so you can use many different allocation strategies, like you can mix. Mix them. So you can use free list. You can use freeps, um, and of course that's still fairly low level. So you might want to have something on top of that. So there's a container library by, run, designed by a firm called NC that um, they do economic modelling. Um, they're in the New York Times, and um, so it's quite easy to have to have containers that go on top of that. So you need to be a bit thoughtful about it if if memory is really, you know. A, a key area for you, but it's not that hard to be thoughtful. I mean, I haven't been programming in, in C for quite some time, and yet, you know, it's, I picked it up quite quickly, so practically speaking, you know, I mean, for sure, for some people, it may be, you know, a killer, but I think it's many fewer than they think. How about, like, uh, the, the people who program in this environment, do they go down, like, they use the GPU for uh, 
so, um, so libraries are, so first of all, you can obviously call any C library, and C++ is, you know, work in progress. Some things you can do, some things you can't. Um, one of the guys that's working with me has written some GPU, you know, libraries, and he's, but I wouldn't say that, I, you know, honestly, you can, there's, they're like three different choices, and they're all robust and complete. Um, you can definitely do it, um, and you can find things to help you. But you'll need to put some work into doing it. You can't expect just to immediately start writing code. Yeah. Um, but there are definitely people using it for scientific computing. So it's, it's possible. Yeah, completely. Yes, pretty much. So. I mean, it's a it's a language that can be as low level as you like. So you know, you can definitely do that. And there's a project called Dlang Science um, that's definitely worth checking out. And that's one of the areas that you know that they're going to be, I think, emphasising. Um, so for memory, I think Andre had a target of 2,000 pull requests for the first half of the year for the language and the library. And I think it fell short by 150 or something. So, you know, there, there are quite a few people that, there's a guy in Japan called Kenji, a slightly mysterious character. And he's just, you know, for example, a, a um, you know, machine in, in fixing bugs. So there are all kinds of different people involved um, to a greater or lesser extent. Um, you know, it has a decent community, and you can just go to GitHub and check it out for yourself and see. You know, don't trust me. <laughs> so, um, so yes, I mean, thank you very much for um, for coming. It's um, you know, I'd, I'd say that it's not a fully mature language, but it's definitely something that you can. You know, I'm I'm advising someone who's managing you know more than two billion dollars, um, and I obviously thought about it quite carefully before entrusting, you know, I've got my reputation on the line. Because if there are real problems with the language, it's, it's terrible for me. Um, and I thought about it quite hot, long and hard and talked to quite a few different people. And it's a language you can, you know, if it suits what you're trying to do um, and you don't mind some rough edges somewhere, then it's definitely, you know, it, it can definitely be very, very useful. And it, it's been so much more productive for me. Um, my client was very concerned about the amount of time it might take to choose some of the things I wanted. Um, and you know, I went home and I wrote something in you know, four hours, and half of that was because I, I couldn't figure out how to plot histograms in using, using this chart library. So, but, but that sort of thing might, might have taken you know, weeks doing it via another approach. So for me, it's been very good. It's been very productive. It's fast. And the best thing, really, is that you can find very smart people via the community. You know, it's like the old Python paradox. But it's, you know, once upon a time, you could, Python guys were really good. So even if they didn't program Python, you wanted to hire Python programmers. That's, you know, I think the case is due now. Thank you very much. <laughs>